Morning to you, Michael. How are you? How's it going, gents? No horses here this morning. That's good. That's good. <laughs> it's too easy to stray into slightly dodgy territory. Um, what is your expectation about how everything is about to play out and unfold? Because it feels like we might be slowly backing our way into a massive conflagration of uh, anger and recrimination when it comes to the new rules, or else they're going to pass off peaceably. I don't know. I just am. I'm concerned that people are going to start tuning into the matches of the weekend. Go, what's this? What's going on? Yeah, I'd have the same reservations, Joe. To be honest with you, uh, it was on a rules meeting yesterday, just getting basically a briefing on all the new rules. And there, are, there are several different rules, but the, the ones that are that, that are really going to be in vogue this weekend are obviously because it's just the hurling weekend. Is are the hurling cynicism rules? Um, Donald Smith, the the head of the the GA's kind of official uh, referees kind of committee, he said that there had been a bit of mayhem uh, in some county in some county training when they actually applied the rules and a lot of guys didn't exactly know what was going on. Somebody dragged somebody down inside the D and they blew for a penalty and <laughs> sent the player to the sim bin and they said there was mayhem ensued. And I think it's going to be something similar this weekend. There's, a, there's, there's one thing with the, with, the, uh, with the cynicism rule in Harland that's a really, really grey area and I think it's this weekend and over the next couple of weekends, we're really, really going to see it. So if you drag somebody down or, you know, a trip or whatever inside the 21 or inside the D, it's going to be a penalty and they're going to get 10 minutes in the sim bin. But if you pull if you pull a jersey back, a jersey tug, which is as cynical as they come, that will not be a penalty and that will not be a sim bin. So rather than dragging players down or jumping on top of guys or anything like that, I just think you're going to see an awful lot more of the jersey being pulled back uh, maybe for a second or two, enough to halt the, your opponent's momentum. You'll take a tick. It's not even a yellow card. You'll take a tick and you'll take your free. So, so I can water ski off the back of you when you're running in to try and score with my two hands pulling out of your jersey and I can be dragged along by you and that slows you down and I won't get a, I get, basically get away with it. As long as you don't drag to the ground or take them to the ground. So... Like it was John Malam was on our podcast at Independent yesterday, and he basically said that, and that he said that's the grey area, and he said he's he's seen it already a lot in Camogie, particularly with a club level with some of the really really influential players. Uh, the other club teams are schooled. Once a player breaks the line, somebody pulls the jersey, tick free, grand. Next time that that probably the best player on the opposition team breaks the line, another player will take a tick. They're well they're well schooled at it. Like we know, like I'm not encouraging you know teams to do this, but people will see gaps in the rules or a gap in the market. Like if you can, if you can pull somebody back, drag somebody back with their jersey, take a tick, a free. Uh, you don't. You avoid uh, a penalty. You avoid ten well, minutes in the sim bin. Like the, it, it the, is a no-brainer that it's going to happen. But it's still, it's still a free, uh, Michael. Just play, play devil's advocate here for for a moment. Like I always think it's ridiculous when we watch the Premier League and a, uh, the, a referee spots a jersey being pulled. And that is the same, and it's given as a penalty, and that's the same penalty as somebody who clocks somebody inside in the in the, the six-yard box. Like, I mean, it's there are, there are varying degrees here, and this is to tackle cynicism. And yes, I agree, pulling a jersey can be cynical, but it isn't on the same level as grabbing a fella and throwing him to the ground. Like, I assume that's what they're thinking when they distinguish between these two things. Yeah, no, that would be the thinking on. The only thing I would say is, like, pulling a jersey, that's a, like, that's a conscious thing that, you, that you're sure. doing. Like it, 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 it is cynical. Like I'm, 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 this is. I definitely don't want to see. I wouldn't want to see, from my opinion, this to be upgraded to a yellow and a sim bin because if that comes in a club hurling next year, I'd probably be spend most of the time on the sideline because <laughs> you're, you're doing it. You're doing it unconsciously at this stage. But but it's a blight on the game. It'd be a much better game if there was no jersey pulling, right? Well, yeah, and you see, there'll be a season or two where there'll be a couple of high-profile incidents. And then all of a sudden, it's just far Damn. more free, yeah. free, far more free flowing. The emphasis is going to be on really, really good, smart defending, and you're going to have to choose your battles probably as well. So now I, I do think like the jersey pull is to me is as cynical as jumping on jumping on top of somebody. It's maybe you're not pulling them to the ground, but I just think people maybe aren't aware of what they're going to see this weekend, and I think they're probably going to see a good bit of that over the next couple of weekends. And it's just hurling this weekend. There's so many games on TV. All eyes are going to be on these games. And the players, referees, haven't had a competitive environment. 
to basically, you know, get used to yeah. this massive change. One of the biggest changes, I would say, in hurling in many, many years. And people are going in quite raw and it's, there's going to be TV cameras everywhere. Well, um, and so we're going to be talking about this a lot, I'd say, Saturday evening and Sunday evening and well into the early next week, I'd say. If, if the good camogie teams are, are being coached that way, presumably the best inter-county players are all being coached. If you feel somebody pulling your jersey, you go down. Like, I, I, the law of unintended consequences here is that we should see an outbreak of diving. That's that's another fear of mine, George, to be honest with you. Again, I was saying it to John Milan, I put it to him yesterday. It was like, you know, you're a, a, a really, really good top inside forward when you were playing. Are you going to try and buy a free? And he's like, he just said, definitely. Of, co of course I will. That's like, it's just, it's a game changer now. It mightn't be the most, uh, might be the most ethical thing to do, shall we say? But if you can, if you can buy a free, buy a penalty, uh, buy ten minutes with the, the opposition team with fourteen players, you're, you're probably going to do it. You, you look at what teams will do to to win now. Uh, be it training early in the morning when they shouldn't be, or training all together when they shouldn't be with the gates locked and two guys doing security on the gates. <laughs> do you think? Do you think that teams aren't going to aren't aren't going to coach? Uh, in official training sessions, they're not going to coach and try and take advantage of these rules. Of course they will. Uh, t sports teams have been taking advantage of any little loopholes and advantages that they can get for years. This, to me, is what looks like a glaring advantage that teams can use. So I would, I would think uh, there'd be a lot of teams trying to be a lot smarter about this. Maybe you won't see that many black cards. Maybe you'll see a lot of tugging back instead. And if you do see that, like that's that's if that's a bigger blight maybe than the than the dragon down yeah a lot of your pk hanging on tickling in Bappe's jersey will be will be happening i'd say a few a few of those photos will be good you you mentioned you were chatting to, to john milan yesterday uh michael uh, he was also making the point that it's on the back of uh, your paper this morning the irish independent that uh, the talk around brian cody potentially being pushed out the door kilkenny is absolutely ludicrous yeah, um, th that that that's his opinion. Uh, he thinks he thinks it's ludicrous, and I'm sure he has plenty of people that would ag that would agree with him. But there is there is a general conversation happening in, within Kilkenny and even outside of Kilkenny. He's obviously heading into his 23rd season. Uh, to me, if I'm looking at it in recent years, if people are talking about you know is Brian Ke Brian Cody under pressure in Kilkenny, to me. He's probably overachieved in recent seasons because uh, some of his best achievements to me are in the last three years, winning a league title against the head in 2018, like beating Limerick with probably you know one of the best performances we've seen in recent years, and even winning the Leinster last year against the head. He, the same personnel, nothing like the same personnel that he had to work with in that golden era is available to him now. You know, there's none of the you know big probably you know marquee players, marquee young players breaking through. There's a reliance on the older guys, a reliance on TJ, there's a reliance on Richie Ogan if he's fit. Colin Fenley's obviously not there this year, and, and him not being there, regardless of the reasons of why he's not there, people will re will read into that. So, like, uh, uh, just from talking to people on the ground, like, there, there, there is, like, I wouldn't say, it's, it's not, not probably, maybe not far off 50-50 on whether, he sh whether Cody should still be involved, and... Uh, that's generally from talking to people in Kilkenny and, you know, we, we've seen with long serving managers before, be it, be it Sean Boylan or, or be it Mickey Hart in Tyrone, uh, regardless of the extraordinary success that they've had, you know, those two reigns probably wouldn't have ended as the guys would like them to have ended. They didn't end as, would say, as happily as maybe they should have had given what, what came before. And I think there'd be some people in Kilkenny would be thinking that something similar might happen in Kilkenny. Um, they're probably lacking the, the 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 class and the squad depth of a Limerick, of a Tip, probably of a Galway, but they're still more than capable of producing, you know, a big knockout punch on a given day. Whether they can produce a couple of those big performances in, in succession and win in All Ireland, I'm not so sure. At the moment, obviously, Limerick are. are favourites because of the quality and depth that you've referred to there and the fact that it feels like they're cresting to a peak as opposed to actually at their peak. Now, in retrospect, they could come off that peak and we'd all be like, oh, that was obvious. It was very hard for them to maintain that for so long. But the age profile, the the evolution of the team, the the controlled performance in the second half of the All-Ireland Final last year, all of that points to a team who, five months down the line, should be fresh and ready to go again. So. Everybody has to measure themselves against that. Are there any other contenders apart from you mentioned Tipperary and Galway? There is there anybody else who can realistically think 
that they can make that leap this year? Uh, outside of those, I'm not, I'm not so sure. Uh, Tip are going to have to marry the old older players with the younger players that won, you know, under twenty and under twenty one at Ireland's, and that's going to be it's going to be they have lots of potential and loads of loads of loads of really good players coming through. But it's very within a confined space of time. This is like. I recall Galway footballers last year in the league wanted wants to kick back up. They were flying before the before COVID hit. Came back, they got pasted by Mayo, and they were beaten by Dublin well in the league, and they never they weren't able to turn around their season at all. It's similar for a Tipper or a Galway now. You can't afford to Tipper playing Limerick Saturday evening. You can't afford to you know throw a load of new guys in, get beaten you know ten or fifteen points, and be chasing you know, chasing your morale almost for the next couple of weeks and trying to lift things again. So it's tricky it's tricky for, for Tip in particular. Uh, Galway were obviously, you know, within touching distance of Limerick heading into injury time in the All-Ireland semi-final last year. They've all the same players on board. You'd hope they'd have, you know, a fully fit Joe Canning for, for you know, the, the whole of big games. So they'll think they be, won't be too far off. Out, outside of that, you know... I, I'd worry about Dublin's squad depth as well, and just I don't think they have a you know a classy or even a couple of classy attackers that that will win big championship games. They don't have a TJ Reid, they don't have an Aaron Galan, they don't have a Joe Canning. So not so sure. Wexford is probably the one, and hmm. with Tip even last year, and even with Wexford last year, what you're looking forward to them this year is it's almost like you know you know the two year old horse that's only had a run or a two runs they still you think they're unexposed you think there's a lot more to come wexford were so flat last year didn't really offer anything last year at all this is davies fifth and final year they're kind of probably coming in this year with a lot less expectation i would have concerns about their squad depth as well Polly foley's not involved this year brilliant halfback drives them forward regularly comes up for a couple of scores i'd wonder about their squad depth too and as well when you're looking at the big marquee attackers that win big championship games, Wexford probably aren't flush with a lot of them as well. So I, I think you're probably still going to be you're still going to be leaning back towards obviously your Limericks and then probably Tipperary and Galway close by as well. It seemed that Wexford never got to a point where they realised what happened last year. Obviously, with the the back door and the, the hammering they took in Leinster, there was almost this this period of reflection publicly where they were doing interviews and talking about what had happened in in that Leinster Championship game. And then it just didn't happen for them against Clare either. I know they had a late rally, but really that was a bit of a hammering early on that they received against Clare. Like uh, he, the the sounds this week from from Dean O'Keefe, I think who, who was up doing media, are, are positive, but it, it just doesn't seem that there is like a, a, an overarching thing that went wrong for them that they definitely have fixed over the course of the winter. No, I think I think Davy and even I was chatting Saoirse Bulf and the coach as well, and they would have said that they went far too hard in the first lockdown. They were expecting. Intercounty Championship in you know July August they didn't get that Wexford as regards du dual status like the vast majority of those guys that be on the Wexford hurling panel will be playing dual with their club so they went from training hard with the county well training hard by themselves for the county going into a club hurling season that was week on week on and a club football season they came back for the intercounty hurling season and they were they were just goose like there was there was nothing left and it looked like right. that and Dermot O'Keefe was a classic exam example like an energizer bunny around the pitch he was you know you could visibly see him flagging in games last year even after 50 or 60 minutes um I think I think it was the Galway game I remember him I remember him just making some big boo-boo near near his near his own end line and it was just from sheer tiredness they look they looked wrecked with Wexford's style of play it has to be all energy and you have to be on point you have to be absolutely bouncing he said he says they're bouncing uh this year but again as regards the depth of the squad and how what you know what players have really been unearthed in the last couple of years outside of maybe probably joe o'connor there haven't been too many players unearthed you'd kind of worry about their squad depth they picked up injuries lee, lee chin had an injury last year once they were missing a big guy like that they were always going to be chasing their tail, but it's it's going to be interesting. I'm sure like Davy's going to bring Hellfire and Brimstone in his last what's what is seemingly his last year down there. There was obviously a year on in, in 17 in his first year, absolutely brilliant. A year off in 18, uh, a year a, a proper year on in 19, where they nearly got to an All Ireland final. A year off last year, so you're, <laughs> if you're following that team, if you're following that team, you'd be expecting something big from Wexford this year. They're going to have to hit the ground running. They're in Division they're in division 1, it's essentially 1B, one, one which is a, a, a definitely the weaker of the two. So 
you can find your feet a bit more in that group uh, playing against playing against Dublin, Kilkenny, and Clare and the likes. Whereas in one A with Limerick, Galway, Tipperary, like that's an absolute shark tank. You have mm-hmm. to hit the ground running straight away. And again, we have probably haven't talked about it. There are going, there's probably going to be an awful lot of injuries this weekend and over the next weekend as well. Just with regards to coming back, they've only been training together three or four weeks. I'm even hearing, you know, anecdotally in a lot of squads that there's, you know, four to five guys on the sidelines already with muscle injuries. Right. Um, and there's going to be an awful lot of guys fatigued. I, I think there's supposed to be rubber stamping the, the seven subs uh a change for this year's league anyway I think it'll brought in for championship as well with seven subs you'll be able to use seven subs just because guys are going to be probably dropping like flies in games just I know they have their own individual conditioning programs done but when you come back into that environment of contact and turning and twisting that the nature of it is is just going to be an awful lot of injuries so that's something we can probably expect over the next couple of weeks too you mentioned there a moment ago the analogy of the two-year-old horse and I think that's definitely true I think last year if you were a young player trying to break into a team, it wouldn't have been a great year for you. You didn't have a, a, a whole body of league games, for example, to get into the squad and obviously less championship games as well. And as a result of that, Michael, it kind of feels that we're unsure about who has the best generation of young players. Like obviously the last two under-20 finals were, were Cork and Tip. But at the same time, if you follow the logic through on Limerick as to why they've been so good, it is because they've got a gilded conveyor belt of talent coming through. So what's your sense of which county has the best young players ready to make a breakthrough this year? As regards Limerick, it, Limerick is an interesting one because Limerick are like the Dubs as well. While they will have underage success and they won the, the Munster Minor last year, that's not the aim. It's not the main aim. It's the same as the Dubs. The aim is to have a player ready to play inter-county at 21 or 22. Ready, like that's what they're focused towards. Uh, success along the way is brilliant, but what they're focused on is getting them ready for senior inter-county. That's kind of where they are now. You probably won't see that many new faces uh, involved in Limerick. Cotton O'Neill is probably one. He's still he's doing the leaving cert. Uh, he's a really, really good forward. But given the, the strength that they have, you're probably, it's like the Dubs. It's so much harder to break through onto that starting team. You might you might see a bit of them in the league, but you probably won't see too much of them. Whereas Tip are probably the, are the probably the main ones that you're you're going to see a lot of the guys that won under twenty and under twenty one All Ireland. Jake Morris was kind of a feature last year. He's probably likely to be featured more. Paddy Cadell will be in there as well. Uh, tip Tip is the really interesting one because they have probably a lot of guys the likes of without you know finishing anyone's career or anything like that. The likes of Paddy Maher, Brendan Maher, probably Noel McGrath, uh, Shamie Callan, who's going to miss the first couple of weeks at back injury. They're probably coming nearing their last dance maybe at inter-county so Sheedy has to find that balance of uh, youth and experience and he's got to find it pretty quickly uh, he's got to find it very quickly uh, one thing we did mention and we're talking about underage success Cork have been there or thereabouts uh, at underage level at minor and under 21 and under 20 in recent years Kieran Kingston probably I would say it was probably a year too late, but he, he culled a good few guys over the winter. Um, in his second coming, his second term as boss, I probably thought coming in the first year that he would make the changes the first year, the first year back. But he's uh, he made the cha- changes in the second season. They have lots of really good young players as well. Uh, the likes of Shane Kingston, who we've seen a good bit of yeah. in in, re- in recent years. There's, they have lo- loads of talent, but their probably big thing is finding out who are they going to play number three and who are they going to play number six because in recent years it's just been kind of an interchangeable feast and if they don't get that problem solved at the heart of their defence they'll put up big scores but they'll concede big scores as well. Right. So if you're talking about underage challenge prob- probably Tip and uh, probably Tip and Cork are the two most likely. Um, Tip is, lastly on Tip as well, Alan Tynan who was had a Munster contract there for three or four years, Munster Rugby, he's on the Tip Hurling panel as well and that's an interesting move. He wouldn't have played that much club hurling uh, for Ross Gray in recent years but Liam Sheedy's obviously taken a punt that, you know, he, he won an All-Ireland minor uh, hurling with Tipperary and he's taken a punt that if he gets him back in in that environment, physically he'll have a huge amount to offer. It's just a matter of brushing his hurling up to, yeah. up to speed. That's, well, he's going to be an interesting one. It's going to be an interesting season. Ah, yeah, absolutely. You've whet the appetite for it brilliantly there, Michael. Thanks a million. Cheers. Cheers, guys.